Uh, my observation from yesterday, contributed to a couple of words uh, by way of a sort of a summary is, in terms of what people felt about it. Um, you know, some words come to mind like a lot of good information, overwhelming, somewhat depressing. Okay, you know, uh, what the hell are we going to do now? And uh, and all of that is very understandable because. You know, again, I underscore this is a working symposium, and I don't know if the last time we have been at a working symposium as opposed to the traditional conference, which have bad needs. But here you're in a room and you want to face each other, you got different perspectives, different ideas. Where do we go from here? It's a little bit more challenging. And uh, so, you know, the, but to get it started, I, I want to ask. Uh, there's a couple of folks in the room that know history really well from a Raza perspective. And uh, I want to ask about El Plan de Aslan. Okay? Uh, and I'd like to ask uh, Mario, Pian, to just briefly say, what was that? Well, we just thought, let me take out a question first. Uh -huh. uh, did you say uh, earlier, Plan de Aslan or Plan de Aslan? Our lives, so to speak, 
and, 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 and they had a bigger starting point because they had a lot more feria than us even 40 years ago. Okay, and I realize that. But again, I'm just trying to highlight, you know, the work that's invested. But I'm not, and I, I think we said at the very beginning together that, let's not look at, you know, that, because we're working in this area, I would say, because I'm doing voter registration, and, and the only thing we need to do is get more Latinos elected. Like, that's the only thing. That's a crucial first thing. We need to get that to happen. But, you know, I saw, but what is happening, and a lot of what we talked about is basically, in some ways, been implied more in terms of state government policies, but there's a lot of things that can go on at the local level that where the power really is, and which really affects people more directly, and it can be argued that that's what we need to start coming in with that. You know, if, if they're doing some creative things in El Valle or in San Antonio, Pueblo, Pueblo, let's say around housing and passing creative policies around bonds for affordable housing, was can we take that to the other cities? And that's just one area. And if San Antonio passed PK, even though we want pre-K statewide for all Latino children, for all children, not just Latinos, but yet we had to do it only at the local level. But Lubbock doesn't have it, Houston doesn't have it, and Wyatt doesn't have it. So what do we need to do to take the local organizing and try to model that? So I'm, there's just a lot of moving parts around that. So I, I just want to highlight that if, you, if your question is what's going to come out of it, it's what we put into it, OK? And, and it's also the question of, yes, our intent is to generate a document that will be fed back to you as a draft for the content of your work, and let's see where we can take it. And some of us may, a handful of us may grab a piece of it, or all of us may grab another piece of it, etc. It just depends on how we're going to work together and move forward to the extent that we can keep some momentum going. Someone already said, we're going to take this on the road, Some this kind of conversation. And I already got, uh, in my possession, somebody already gave me a draft of the policy development and strategy for social change in Texas. Policy proposal, proposal for Latino-centered policy study center. Okay, so, and that's gonna come up probably in one of the sessions uh, for the person who gave me this in terms of when we get into the fact that yesterday we just warmed up, just barely, in the conversation at the panel level, right? it was just get it as do, get it as do, and then what are some of the issues? Okay, but this morning with this morning panel, I wanted to kind of try to exemplify that in building that plan, at least you know, and I'm, I'm saying it candidly, at least from my perspective, a few others, but maybe not yours. Three critical components of that is how do we build capacity to move that plan? Because we could right now talk about a thousand issues and then talk about policies that might respond better to those issues. Or, or not. But then we ask the question, what capacity do we have to get it done? Because in the room, people were saying, well, why do anything? Because in effect, because all the power that you know that people have right now, they're not letting the room agenda. And I don't think and Part of that is true, but again, the other part is what we can still be doing, right? And so, so those three areas, again, is organizing. What is our current level as Latinos, locally and statewide, in our, in our organizing capacity? That in and itself, you know, are we talking about organizing to get voter turnout, to get Latinos elected, you know, to just address a similar issue, et cetera, et cetera, right? What is the quality of that capacity coming from different groups that do exist or groups that we still need? The second is policy development. You know, regardless, we still need data. Okay? You know, I, and, and we still need information. And I'll just pick one out of the blue. You know, you've heard about the, the, the problems with CPS and kids dying, right? And the budget is totally always underfunded for the last two decades. Of CPS right, and the, kid, the issue with foster care. Has anybody asked how many of those kids that are dying are Latino? I haven't seen anybody ask that. Right? What proportion of those kids are ours? Where's our information and our advocacy there? 
So I'm just trying to pick on one thing. So when we think about policy development, where is the information that supports grassroots advocacy? And I'm not talking about research. And here's where sometimes we, we, we need to delineate. I'm not talking about an academic paper. Uh, hopefully we're clear about that. I'm glad we got Latinos and others in academia doing good research, even around Latino-based research. But that doesn't necessarily translate into a policy research paper, whether that's five pages long or 10 pages, or then you can massage for the media, or that to create allies to get support behind what we want. So there's a whole level of issues around developing the policy development capability, or that. Where's our think tank for that? Is there a Latino think tank in Texas? No. We don't have it, okay? And I know we have allies like CPPP, great organizations, and a few others, or that, but they're not always on the, the same lens. And we may agree on some things, but not agree on others. So where is our own capability for policy development that supports our issues? Right? And the third one, again, is organized, is communication. The whole issue, the story that I said last night, can you imagine selling that story last night from the teatro in some way a toda la gente general? You see? That's an aspect of messaging. Right? How do, we try, how do we carry our stories so that someone doesn't change the narrative? Okay, I, I know I stepped into it yesterday with the word vulnerable and poverty. <laughs> well, but I read, I read it from the standpoint of caution about how that's interpreted by the other side. The narrative from the far right about what that means and who it's for, right? or by bureaucrats who translate something and implement it a program. This, that's not necessarily our narrative about even what that is and what that represents, okay? So how do we tell our story and do our own messaging and what people do we need in terms of media communication, you know, and, and none of this in each of these areas says that we don't have anything, okay? We do have some things, some stronger in some areas than others, right? So, that said, I'd like to start with a conversation first about what the big label is political obstacles for us to gain in power. And I'd like to introduce Jose Garza Jr. I'm junior, senior, I'm sorry. But I was trying to give you last only two. And uh, Jose Garza Sr. who been for, for you know, quite a number of years, to say the least, has been engaged in this whole issue of gerrymandering and others in terms of civil rights, and he's actively engaged right now in a case that you all will probably already be aware of, but I'd like him to just share from his perspective and his experience, and I'm asking each of the panels, by the way, give us about 10 minutes, and then we can do a little Q&A, but uh, and I'd like to start with Jose. My name, my father's name was Fernando, so I'm not uh, <laughs> oh, Joey. That's right, Joey. Um, so, I guess I've been at this for, since I'm not junior, I'm really, really senior. Excuse me, I've been at this for, here? Okay. So, I've been at this for a, a very, very long time, and I feel, uh, and, and one of the things that I've noticed is how little things have actually changed. Um, I mean, that just that line from Juan about, took them 40 years to gain power, not in Texas. I mean, I, I was there in 1977, right? And then, uh, yes, they were all Democrats, but so what? The Latinos were on the sidelines. And gerrymandering was going on in the political process. We had uh, cities that were underrepresented all over the state. We're doing a lot better in that regard, but it's still not uh, anywhere close to, to parity. Uh, and those things are, are happening now. Uh, so yes, the, the, the courts have found uh, that the new obstacles that they're presenting uh, were done with the intent to uh, deny Latinos and other people of color the equal opportunity to participate in an election process. The efforts that have gone into things like voter ID, the resources that went into establishing that and 
and I think that when if you look at it, we're really talking about a very small part of our community. The lengths they go to to suppress the vote of a very small segment of our community, but that's what they were aiming to do, and they spent millions of dollars defending that very little increment of keeping those people from the ballot box. Uh, the, the, uh, what they're doing on, on redistricting, the courts have found that the plan for the Congress and the plan for the State House of Representatives were intentionally drawn to uh, minimize the opportunity, primarily of Latinos, but also of African Americans from participating in the electoral process. In District 23, the congressional district that runs from San Antonio to El Paso along the border of Texas, along the Rio Grande. Um, the lengths they went to identifying Latino voting precincts that had very little turnout and putting those into the district and identifying voting precincts that had high Latino turnout and pulling those out of the district so that when you look at the total population, it looks like the district is a strong district. But they went to this level of, 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 uh, of searching. I mean, one of the drawbacks of having uh, technology that we do is you can identify these precincts with a click of a, of, a, you know, of a mouse. You can find those voting precincts. And what they did, and there's emails going back and forth about how to measure the, the uh, the effectiveness of the district. The Attorney General developed a matrix specifically for this purpose where they identified 10 races <coughs> involving Latino candidates. And they identified it that way. They did not identify Democratic candidates. They were all Latino candidates. And these were the preferred choice of the Latino community statewide. And that's how they measured the strength of the district. So when they look at, at District 23, over that 10 election cycle races, the district, as I mean, as we all know, District 23 is a flip flop. This is one year, one election, it'll vote for the Latino for the candidate, and the next time in angle, it's a flip flop district. And when they measured it, when the way it was before redistricting started, Latinos had elected three of those 10, uh, or had voted for three of those 10. Uh, candidates that they had identified. And the messaging back and forth was, let's reduce that to one. And they did. They reduced it to zero. They said, we've gone too far. Bring it up to one out of 10. We can control the district at one out of 10. It doesn't look so bad. And they did that in San Antonio to the State House of Representatives. Um, so all over the map, you can find instances of, in 2011, and 2013 of the people in power in Austin looking to do exactly that. And they defend themselves by saying, we were only going after Democrats. We were trying to bolster up Republicans. But that's not what the internal data shows. They were looking at specifically identifying where Latinos had voting power and where they didn't, and then manipulating the lines in order to achieve that. So you have the redistricting order that came out uh, on uh, March 10th, and then the more recent one, uh, very recently, on the State House of Representatives, both the Congress and the State House of Representatives, in, that, in which the court found intentional discrimination. There's a, a congressional district in, in, uh, in, down in Fort Worth, we called it during the trial, the, the Lightning Bolt District, because it starts out as a square uh, district. And then it runs through Fort Worth with all these jagged edges uh, going through Fort Worth, looking like a, a lightning bolt coming in from Collin County into Fort Worth. When you go down to the block level, what they were doing is picking up every Mexican box they could find and putting it into Collin County so it wouldn't affect any of the congressional districts in Fort Worth. That's where the power would have been, right? That's where this growth in, in the Latino population there and in Dallas. Uh, so these were specific redistricting techniques uh, that they were using. Um, but as I said, I mean, this is really not anything new. I mean, that's the kind of, of policies that when the Democrats were in control back in the 70s, that's what they would do during the redistricting in 
1970, uh, in 1980, in 1990. Then the power started shifting to Republican uh, control of the state. But, you know, I don't know. I mean, from my uh, point of view, I, I think all that's shifted is that the Dixiecrats who controlled the Democratic Party in the 70s moved over to the Republican Party. So it's the same sentiment. It's the same bigoted sentiment. I mean, everybody you know, wants to be careful about calling. We had, during the trial, we had the hardest time getting friendly Latino Democratic representatives to get on the stand and say that these actions were intended to be racist, that the, their columns were racist, but they are. And they proved it again in the current session, in which they are targeting the immigrant community, they are attack, they're attacking people that they just don't like. They're bigots about those sorts of things. And I think that the, Rafael Antia made a, a speech the other day in which he had been reluctant uh, to do exactly that, to challenge his colleagues. But he said, you know, the evidence is mounting. I don't know what else I can do. So the options in the current session that the leadership, the, the moderate Joe Strauss led the House of Representatives, and, uh, and, and even worse in the Senate, the options they give Latino uh, uh, legislators is, here's a bad bill. Why don't you come up with some amendments? And then they look at the amendments and they say, no, none of the, those are good. We're going to reject all of them. But here's a worse bill. Line up or we go with the worst bill. I mean, what is that but bigotry? But what else is that? So anyway, uh, I guess there have been a, there has been a lot of progress. There are a lot more rich Mexicanos, I guess. There's a lot more of us. Uh, in the middle class or in the upper middle class, but I think those things are eroding, so we have to be careful about that. And anyway, I don't see a lot of things. <clears throat> Thank you. But I'd like to go to Lucia, uh, our panel. Uh, Rob Santos is uh, with the Urban Institute out of DC, but he's at the Hano, he's a lifelong resident of Boston. And uh, uh, San Antonio, I think it was in Austin, correct? And, uh, and his background is extensive in terms of uh, particularly engaging and working in what we would call a think tank, and that's the Air Institute. And I'm going to let him speak to that. But the whole point here is for Rob, I'm asking you to talk a little bit about the Urban Institute in the context of the roles it plays relative to policy making, policy development, and engagement, if you will, and in order to kind of reflect on, should we kind of having something like that in Texas, if you will? So I just want to let Rob go with okay, uh, Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, first, I wanted to say that uh, I'm a big product, probably one of the last, one of the last uh, kiddos that was able to uh, from uh, back in the 70s, before the institute started caving in. And I was fortunate enough to, uh, after going to SAC, to go to transfer to Trinity and then go to the University of Michigan. And I wanted to be a math professor. Uh, but there was this gentleman at the Institute for Social Research, Microsoft, and he was doing a national survey of people of descent. And he was using that as a vehicle to bring in all the Latinos, uh, graduate students that could find in Michigan to help train them in research and get them back to the And in a one hour meeting, he convinced me not to be a math professor of the statistics that you can And uh, so it's because of that that I, I've spent my life as a statistician working. Uh, we, we are hearing you, but go ahead and lift your voice up. It might be more. Okay. Uh, we have, uh, I've spent my life uh, working in academic as well as policy research centers uh, all over the country. And um, I migrated, uh, well, I, what I wanted to say in the context of policy research and think tanks is that I found in my migration that there's a really important uh, uh, 
confluence of journal articles, scholarly research, policy research, and advocacy. And you really need those three working together in order to have an evidence base that you can take to the public and, uh, and try to make changes in terms of policy. So uh, at Urban Institute, we uh, basically, we claim to be nonpartisan, but most of the folks say we do. Um, it was actually started by uh, Lyndon Johnson back, uh, back in the 60s, late 60s, uh, with Bob McNamara and, and such, uh, to, to examine the effects of the property. It's been, so it's been in existence a long time. And the idea is to, is to put, give to the public, to policymakers, uh, to, uh, to legislators, etc., cetera, uh, the results of research, you know, good statistics, data, that can allow them to have a better discussion, a more uh, cogent discussion about whatever social issues uh, are at the forefront of you know, uh, uh, a bill or whatever type of policies being, being uh, set forth. Be it issues on housing, on tax, on health, uh, whatever. Uh, at Urban, we found that in order to uh, be most effective, it's best to look holistically rather than its and I'll, I'll give an example uh, with yesterday's uh, discussion in our small group. I was in the employment group. And the first thing we did was we said, OK, let's take a look at the demographics of uh, you know, uh, employment and the shrinkage of uh, middle wage uh, jobs. Well, that required a demography. It required uh, manipulation of, of uh, federal and state statistics. We then started talking about, well, look at how many Latinos have VAs in the state of Texas. And compare that to the nation and the state of Texas. Well, that, bring, that invokes the whole issue of education and its role with labor and being able to get a job. Well, we didn't talk about it, but then there's health issues. How many Latinos have chronic <coughs> health conditions that prevent them from being able to get VAs? Uh, there are other issues if you can't afford. Uh, I was actually looking at the Urban Institute uh, uh, map of affordable housing in the state of Texas. There actually isn't very much affordable housing in the state of Texas, especially in places like Austin and San Antonio, the, the big metro areas. Um, if you can't hold on to your house and you have to be moving, how does that impact your ability to, to get a job? So they're, they're, uh, holistically, one needs to look at the interactions uh, between systems of policies like education, health, labor, economic development, and so forth. And that's what Urban is bringing to the table now in terms of the type of research it's doing, the type of reports, visualizations, et cetera, uh, nowadays. Uh, an important component of that is visualization. And so we've uh, got things are now, it's not a matter of putting out this big, big report, 500 pages, table after table. You need to tell the story. And so there's been a huge investment uh, in our communications department to, uh, to create visualized data that tell stories. Add to that short blocks. <coughs> Take large reports and streamline them, pull out little pieces or briefs, and then send out sort of essentially sound bites of communication that are very effective in terms of getting uh, media pickup, in terms of legislatures talking about bills and how the influence is going to be. And so, in the, in the bigger picture, we need this, the scholarly research because that's what creates the conceptual frameworks and uh, the, the evidence base to then allow us to do the policy research and make recommendations for policy that legislatures can take. You need the communication piece because without that, if you communicate poorly, then you're not going to be uh, very effective uh, in terms of uh, advancing sort of your uh, policy. 
So um, I guess that, that's what I, you know, I wanted to talk about the, the need for all the three elements the, the, uh, the scholarly research, the policy research. Thank you. Sanchez is the director for the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center here in San Antonio. And just from a distance, because I'm not, I can't claim to know about Esperanza Peace and Justice Center in any detail. But I know that they have a combined experience of not only what they do, but also in terms of their activism, in terms of organizing at the local level for issues of which they felt were important. And I thought I wanted to exemplify at least at a local level, some of that organizing we're not, and, and just have her, again, because that's an aspect, again, as we get into the discussion of how, you know, the levels of organizing we need to do local and statewide, but uh, she can speak to that a little bit. Bueno, buenos días. Buenos días. Yeah, and I also want to, to, to acknowledge that one was my boss once upon a time. Uh, I also worked with Jose when I was thinking of being a lawyer and then decided not to. <laughs> but I think they also, I want to honor uh, you all for teaching me when I was just a few years younger than you, but uh, young. Um, <laughs> we yeah, usually have on honoring women, so I want to please acknowledge some of the men around. But I, I, I guess um, I, my role is to talk about the organizing piece, and I, I want to say very clearly that to be a capable agent for social, economic, environmental change, at the core of our work is to maintain a strong and broad support of our community. You know, so be with community, be of community, and I think we've lost that concept, lost that idea. Um, if we look historically, you know, the 1800s, the early 20th century, no teníamos nada, you know, so we were out there organizing, we were knocking on doors, we were, you know, pulling our hair, we were being strung and uh, out there to die, and we, we could see it and we could react, because it was, that racism was that much more evident, and so we were reacting and responding, and the Alonso Perales and the Gus Garcias were the few educated guys that were our attorneys who were out there and organizing. And then, you know, we start winning, and then we have the creation of Maldiv and Southwest Voter and all our, you know, and they're coming out of here, San Antonio, right? I mean, so there's amazing stuff happening. And if you look at women's issues, you know, Roe v. Wade uh, it also comes into reality, you know, just the, you know, housing is an issue and there's money put in there, affirmative action, and I'm also one of the last ones <laughs> there that got to get funding and get into really good schools, but but then, you know, then all of a sudden we're creating social, uh, uh, we're creating other institutions that become more of the bureaucracy, but we need to have, you know, we're going to talk about healthcare, we do need to create the clinics, and then, but then we get caught up in running the clinics and we stop doing the work at the community level. We start, uh, you know, getting single member districts created, we get, we get the, the districts, we elect our Latinos, and then they don't even support our work. But we got them in there, you know, 40 years later they're in there, but are they really representing community, are they representing someone else? Um, and so, you know, the same thing with, you know, can women and women's clinics and um, affirmative action, we're in the schools, but, you know, 40 years later, people, you know, how many Latinos and black people and women have said, I hate affirmative action, I have nothing to do with affirmative action, you know, that because we've been attacked so much that so we don't want to say that something really did help us to be in that, to have gotten that education, to have not left the university uh, with you know fifty, a hundred thousand dollars debt that our young people are not having to deal with, we didn't get that. I mean, I had ten thousand dollars of debt, but it's nothing like a hundred thousand. Um, so I think we forgot that piece. And again, because I worked at Malden, because I worked at Southwest Voter Registration Project, I was able to take all the learning there, but also say what's missing. 
and I think part of our work is to constantly be connected to community. Um, and I also want to honor the fact that Esperanza was listening to the voices of mujeres that were doing a lot of the thinking at that time in the 70s and 80s that were women like Gloria Salu and Shumi Moraga, Audrey Ward, African American and Latina women who were doing this intersectional analysis that I can't just stand here t today and talk to you to you as a working class Chicana from the west side of San Antonio, but I'm also a mujer, yeah. I'm also a lesbian, I'm also, you know, X, Y, and Z, right? There, there are many um, identities that we all, everyone here, take on, right? And we're on all the issues that we deal with affect us and we have to think holistically, and that's that intersectional vision and idea. It's a holistic way because you can't, you know, you can't do it with just parts of me. It's not just my arm that's being affected. It's not just my heart that's being affected. It's not I'm losing hair or getting white. It's the reasons that you know we have to think holistically, and I think that was part of the vision that we found people just working on separate issues. So Esperanza has always been about bringing all the issues that be it, that yes, we may want jobs, and so therefore fracking is a big deal in South Texas because it's going to create jobs, or putting uh, detention centers in South Texas are good because they're jobs, uh, but wait a minute, those are messed up jobs and that messed up policy, and again, who's pushing that? Lots of our Latino elected officials at the local, state, and national level. And and what do we do? You know, I mean we have created research. And that, you know, and part of it is our own research that you know we taught people how do you how do you do your own research? You know, we've also taken research done by people. I mean right now there's a whole Vista Ridge of water pipeline that we had professors at Trinity put together all this analysis. And we went before council members and they're like, we don't believe you, we don't agree with you, it doesn't matter. And it was just about we need water because a million people are going to come in. And then we look at numbers, it's like, well, wait a minute, how are those million people coming in? Are we just annexing people? That's one way you get more people. Um, and I mean, we did research and we are like, these numbers are really just messed up, but it becomes their quick and easy way to say, this is why we need that. But without that holistic vision, how does it, what does it mean to go into debt $3.4 billion? And who is it going to affect the most when people are barely making enough money in this town to pay their utility bills, water, electricity, and now you're going to just increase it, you know, the first year, you know, another 20%, another 40%. But what was a $20 water bill becomes a $70 water bill and becomes a $150 water bill. If we're middle class, we can pay it. If we're upper class, we can pay it. I mean, there are so many people in the north side who have lavish lawns and you and in the newspaper it's in there. It's like these are the top 20 water users and they get, you know, they get charged a little bit more. But they can do that. On the other hand, in the south side, in the west side, in the near east side, people's water is being cut, right? You cannot live aguas vida. <laughs> and, and so, again, we have a holistic analysis and the information. Okay, so we will build a pipeline that is going to allow us not to live with restrictions. You know, so we can waste all the water we want as long as you can pay for it. So some people waste it, and other people have their wet water shut off. But the you know, but it's all about the million people coming in, and those million people are not necessarily. We're not taking care of the ones who have been here 100 years, 150 years, and that's what we find over and over. Whatever the issues may be, sometimes again we're fighting ourselves. I mean, we can get hundreds of people into city council office. I mean, a uh, meeting, right? So once upon a time, as an individual speaker, I had 10 minutes that I could speak. And then a few years later, as an individual, I was allowed five minutes to speak. And then they see 100 or 200, and it's like, you all have a minute to speak. And that happened because, you know, Harburger said, well, Harburger liberal, 
you know, I, you know, I don't, I have to go home at seven o'clock, right? So he gets to go home at seven o'clock or go to functions, whatever. But I, we remember meetings that went on to two and three and four in the morning, <laughs> and now it's like, well, it's too much. We can't do that. So, so, and of course, as you know, when do folks have meetings, right? During the day, when are all these policies being enacted? When, if you're going to deal with zoning, if you're going to deal with whatever the issue is, the meetings you have to go to are during the day, Monday through Friday, from 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock. They don't think about weekend meetings or after 6 o'clock meetings. After 300 years of existence, and they me as they finally have a bilingual uh, translator in the city. Why did it take 300 years? So, <laughs> Three years ago, there were 300 people that lived in the Mission Trails uh, neighborhood. They were displaced because of economic development, because we want to beautify, you know, the Mission Trails area. But those folks had lived there 35, 40 years. But there's something better. I don't know who it's better for. It wasn't better for those people. But we had a council. Majority Latinos is those 300 people. And there is a report that just came out this past Tuesday that gives major analysis. But that analysis we didn't even have to create because we know other moments and other places where people have been displaced and we know the consequences of that displacement. And we let them know that they didn't care because, again, where's the money coming from? What is the future of that elected official? So that's why people don't vote. <laughs> I'm being cut off. So again, we can register people to vote. They're not going to vote if our politicians are just as bad as the ones we had before, and then the Dixiecrats or the Republicans. And, and people aren't that pathetic. They're just, they've just given up. <laughs> so we have to change that model. And thank you for doing the work you all are doing. All of us here are doing that work. We just have to be mass fierce. Okay. Our next speaker is for, uh, Laura Baverena, and uh, she has she's a, she has the business of media politics, and it pretty much tells you what it is in one sense of helping campaigns. But the thread of that, I'm sure, is messaging. But I asked her if she could kind of put it in a broader context, not necessarily for a campaign, but I think in terms of trying to apply the thread of why we need good communication, good messages that tells our story. So I'll just let her uh, go with that. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to start by saying, uh, oh, I am tired. It's been a rough couple of years for us, rough couple of six, six months. It's been hard. So it's nice to be here with you guys because I feel like reinvigorated because, uh, you know, I was one of those persons who woke up every day after the election and cried for two weeks. That was me. Uh, and then I stopped and then I kept crying. Uh, and then now as we go into this um, session in Texas, in the Texas legislature, uh, it's, it's painful. It's hard. And so it's so really invigorating for me to come here and see all of you because it's like, I need that esperanza. I need that energy to get back to work because there's a lot of work to do. Uh, and I and I wanted to tell Juan that during our session yesterday, we had a lot of kind of conversation, and you were in that too, where we were talking about um, you know putting our policy agenda together. And uh, it was a discussion about whether or not we should use the word union or not. Mm. Okay. I got a bunch of this. It's the Russians. Anyway, so we had a discussion about whether or not we should use the word union in our policy position paper. And uh, okay. so we had this discussion about whether or not we should use the word union in our policy whether or not we should use the word union in our policy discussion we're having. And we kind of sketched it for a little bit, and I thought, uh-oh, whoa, wait a minute, let's back up. We, I, I, I kind of think this session is really the reboot. Because we've had these conversations before. All of us have. We've sat in these rooms where we talked about, you know, the disparities, the poverty, 
you know, economic this, economic, I, we've had these discussions. It's a mismo cosa, right? So for me, it's like this conference is the reboot, right? It's like movies. Let's reboot. And when we reboot, let's go back to the basics. Let's ask ourselves, who is our audience? Is it the Texas legislature? When we come up with this, is it the Texas legislature? And if it is the Texas legislature, who in the legislature? Is it the union? Is it organizing groups? Is it policy elites like ourselves? Not yet. Not even started. I'm not still saying that. I'm not still saying that. Is it is the policy elites? Is it folks like ourselves? Who is the audience? That's a critical question we need to ask ourselves. Because that's going to determine how we message ourselves, how we talk about it, whether or not we use the word union or not, whether or not we use the word poverty, because words matter, right? Um, is that audience corporate America? Is this about getting investment into our community? Is this what this paper is about? Do we change the language to target sponsors, Coca-Cola, AT&T? Is that what we're about? But the next basic question I want to ask is, what do we want? Why do we want to reach them? What for? For what purpose? Do we want them to think a certain way? Do we want them to act a certain way? Do we want them to reject something altogether? Well, we know from experience that we can produce these little white papers, research papers, present them to local communities, Texas legislature. Is that really going to change the way they think? Are we changing the way they think by showing them a piece of paper? We're not. We're reaching, we're hitting obstacles. And then the third sort of basic thing I want to go back to is what delivery systems are we using to give them this information? Is it a white paper? Is it a report? Is it a meme? What? How many people will read a white paper and how many people will read a meme? Right? But the question all comes down to who is our audience and what do we want them to do? Basic communication. Right? Um, and I was really happy when we started this session to hear Ron talk about going back to local communities. Because I feel like what we need to do, if we don't have control over the Texas legislature, we don't. But we have control over some local government. We have control over some local school boards, some water boards, some important government bodies that we can take this policy paper, this agenda, and have them push it. And then when they push it, when they have success, just as you said, take free paper essay and take that and put it in Lubbock and put it in these other cities. Put it in cities and then use that as a model to build capacity and create communication around that. And I'll close because I know I want to get to the question answer part, but What's key in all of this, obviously, you know, go on and on about like social media and blah, blah, blah. But I, I do, I think what's important, is, and I don't want to not talk about, is political theater. Political theater is a must. I, I have a friend, uh, you probably know him because he's an old activist, Randy Barras. He's a king of political theater. He understands it and what it means. And when I talk about political theater, it, it's about creating a media attention. Remember, media are not, and I love to, to talk to, to young kids about this because they say, what's the purpose of media? What's the purpose of media? And they'll say, oh, to inform, to educate. And I'm like, oh. The purpose of media is to sell newspapers, is to sell ads, if they're a business, and that's what they do. So what we have to do as activists is create material that's salacious, that's exciting, that sells ads, that gets eyeballs on the newspaper, that gets eyeballs on the TV side. <laughs> so a perfect example of this is uh, back when the wonderful Sheriff Arpaio, so Sheriff Arpaio, they were, were going after him in, uh, in Arizona. I wish I'd come up with this idea. These young kids did it, they were amazing. What they did is, 
outside of his office during election time when they were trying to get him out of office, they threw a retirement party. They threw tables, a piñata, a mariachi, a band. They even brought a moving truck. A moving truck to say, yeah, it's temple, brother, you're going out. And I was like, that's amazing. That's, that is what creates media attention. And then you build on that, right? Then you create the memes. Then you get the social media thing to go viral and, and kind of create these things. So, no, I'm, I'm going to stop there because I can go on and on. But uh, I'm excited to be here and thank you for your questions. These are threads that I hope people will pick up in terms of not only the, you know, what they question, what they suggest, but also what you bring to the table. Uh, but I want to stop there and just see if anyone just has any questions for any one of the folks up here on the panel. Follow up. Um, I'm Linda Chavez. I'm with Texas Voting Rights Coalition. Uh, I just wanted to say that I and we're a fairly new organization. We just got chartered in 2011, but we got chartered for the purpose of being connected with all that on the city. So congratulations <coughs> on that, and I was attentive on that on that process. Anyway, my 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 thing to all four of you is, I believe, and I've always thought that our communication is not strong enough. Our communication is, we don't all communicate the same thing. And let me give you an example. Roe versus Wade, okay? When a person says, you know, that they support uh, pro-choice, automatically the, the R's on the other side say you're for abortion. That's not true. That's not true. So our, our communication, I don't believe, that every single organization, Latino organization in the state, need to be communicating the same rhetoric that the Republicans communicate. And, and that's been my thing. It's like, how do we get there? How do we communicate the same message against them that they have been so successful in communicating against us? That's my question. <laughs> Anybody have an answer? Or I, I, I don't know that I'm going to answer. I'm not going to answer the question. I know they perfectly, but I think you know. I think it comes down to what we call issue framing, right? They frame the issue, so suddenly we're discussing the issue within the frame that they've created, rather than creating our own frame and discussing it within that context. Um, you know, I think a good example to talk about this in, in real terms would be take, for instance, the SB five, the anti-sanctuary bill. So where you're showing, you know, the whole show your papers thing. Did I get the bill number right? Four. 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 Sorry. Four. <laughs> I thought so. I got the bill number wrong. Four. Okay, so four. Um, so when we think about this and we think about Latino, working class Latinos <laughs> that are citizens, you think they really care about this issue? Probably not. They'll care about it though when the police start pulling them over and profiling them. Right? When it starts to affect them, they'll care about it. So let's, you know, rather than waiting until this happens, let's be proactive. Let's create messaging around what we know is going to happen. We know American citizens are going to get pulled over and asked to show their citizens. We know this. So let's do something like hashtag one brown, one white. For every brown you pull over, you got to pull over a white person. Then it's not profile. You know, let's get ahead of the game. Let's think creatively about what we can do to frame that messaging so that it benefits us and not people. Any other questions? Well, no, he, he, she asked the soft answers and we're all ready to yeah. answer. Okay. Yeah. I, I was uh, actually just going to uh, point out one, one uh, point uh, that uh, Laura made that I thought was excellent, which is who's your audience? And depending on who your audience is, you, you will frame the problem differently and use a different approach to communicate your message. So for example, issues of entitlements, you know, helping people in poverty or vulnerable populations. Well, for uh, sort of the, the more uh, Democrats or, or sort of left-leaning folks, you talk about the need and the values of helping people uh, who, are, who are 
Constitution, for the, the Republican type, sort of the, the conservative people, you don't say, oh, here are people in need and we need to help them, because they don't buy them. They, they think, oh, that's their own responsibility. Instead, you frame it as, we need to provide these people an opportunity to lift themselves up. So you switch it around and use different, essentially different approaches that are tailored to the different audiences. And sometimes that can be effective, and sometimes they just ignore it. Yeah, and I wanted to uh, use the example of the Esperanza versus the city of San Antonio. In 1997, 20 years ago, Esperanza gets defunded by the city, um, even though we had ranked first in our division of complete disciplinary, and even though it was the second year, so they had already funded us one year, so they. But they, they defunded us because they, they used the wedge issue as, you know, we don't want to support gay people, right? But they really didn't want to support an organization that was an activist-based arts organization. Because we were talking about immigration. We were talking about, you know, pro-choice. We were talking about all the issues. And we did that through our cultural programming and theater and films and whatever. So we spent the whole year talking to the community to see if we should file a lawsuit because, yeah. But we said, you know, lawsuits, again, they can get caught up in court and how are we having conversations. So after a year of having conversations with the community every month, probably twice a month, they said yes, right? So we moved forward and the first thing, we don't talk about censorship because as Latinos, as people of color, as poor people, we've always been censored, right? The, the tag was respeto es fácil. That was their first frame, right? That's like, we should respect each other. Um, as we talked, and we knew we were going to lose in court. So the strategy was that the court case was going to make us do the community organizing. And what that meant was we were going to be going back to house parties, going back and talking to people about what the issues were. And we came up with another tag, which was Todos Somos Esperanza, right? So it was like, wow, yeah, we're all cold. Yeah, we can do this. And then the conversations ultimately ended up being about discrimination in the city. Or at that moment, English only. People got that this was coming down in California. And, and to get a, a bumper sticker or a yard sign to put up in your house, you know, you had to go to those meetings. And you had to agree that you were supporting an organization that did all these things, and maybe you weren't pro-gay or you were pro-choice, but all of a sudden you saw the connection. We were talking to Rotary Club members, and I was scared about that, you know, Republicans. We were talking to folks that like the Todos Somos Esperanza because they thought we were religious, right? And that we want the signs, and it's like, we can't have the sign unless you support. And then again, how did we reach the people? So Cristal was just had just come to San Antonio, and she went to one of the meetings, and people wanted to do street theater. So she worked with you know 30, 30 people, and we set up three different teatros, and then one of them really just went to the top, and that one at twelve you know new mass people come out after that, and there's a teatro performing right. So we're messaging to different communities, and then at the end we have those banners just before we go to court. It says Todos Somos Esperanza, and then you go throughout the city and you see Todos Somos Esperanza signs. I thought that that was helping the judge be courageous. Like, if he saw all those signs, that maybe people actually liked the Esperanza or could believe it, that it was an issue. And the other one was Artes Vida, because they said poor and working class people don't support the arts and culture, that they're more interested in other things. And we had ranked 40th with the city, and after this campaign, we went up to rank 9th. And then they haven't cut the arts in the same way. So, it does take a lot, but it, it is about talking to different communities because we're all needing to reach the information that we're Thank you. Oh, and also, it's real quick. Um, I came here, there was no hashtag. There's no hashtag one. Go ahead. I created a hashtag. Uh, LPS 2017. So were you tweet tweeters out there? Twitterers? Uh, what I'm doing is LPS 2017. You need to be hashtagging this. And if you're not on Twitter, shame on you. Everyone should be on Twitter.
As I mentioned yesterday, I think generally speaking, uh, I can't speak in detail for each of the groups, but what I picked up was that the folks of carbon production did get into a discussion of sort of delineating different kinds of issues within those areas. And at the same time, just beginning to touch a little bit about its relationship to some policies. But not these are the kinds of things we need to do to get the influence, to get those policies done. And so that's kind of a snapshot of each group coming out with a summary report, again, of those major policy areas, that the, you know, whether the kinds of organizing we need to do, the kinds of, in terms of ideas, even of whether we're doing them or not, the, the things around communications, the things of what kind of policy development potentially. So in anything that sort of comes out, but that's kind of the basic idea for each of the groups to come out with that. And the intent is that we're in combination with some of the content from the different presentations and uh, discussion papers and the content, because remember we're taking those conversations as well as the summaries that are described as taking, all of that is going to combine into some kind of a draft in terms of some type of blueprint. And I can't tell you what that's going to look like, uh, but that's, that's, the, that's the product that we want to do that. Yes, sir. Uh, John Gonzalez. Uh, John. Very, I, very good symposium, uh, very good start to the symposium. Very impressed with the way we approached the task at hand. But just based on the very short hour, hour and 15 minutes we had uh, yesterday, I believe that uh, at best we're going to come up with a very, very rough sketch, very, very basic outline of what we want the end product to look like. And I would like to suggest to you a tremendous amount of humility and respect that I think what we want to do is great, but I think it's going to be a time-consuming process, which is going to go well beyond the symposium, and perhaps we can talk about it later on. Uh, but what we what we need is an A-plus product, because when we're talking about communication and who is our target, in my opinion, the target is people that don't look like us, and to convince them, it's going to have to be a very professional document and it's going to speak to what drives their motivation. To me, it's business, it's economics, and it's money. And if we, we should not focus our strategy on getting them to do something because it's the right thing to do. We should focus on the strategy being getting to do something because it's in their best interest. So having said that, uh, I'm going to do my best this morning and this afternoon to contribute, but I think it's going to take a while to get together what I believe you envision one, which is, I think, is an excellent vision and much needed, but it's just going to require time. Well, I, I don't disagree with that, and I think that's part of the conversation that you'll have. That, that's why I said it's a working document, or not. It's not a finished product, because and I think there's also elements, even discussions, where folks may say, well, who is our audience? And I think that still has to be answered, because I don't know that folks would agree with that perspective. And they may. Or, not, or maybe it's multiple audiences, because I think we're still trying to build coalitions among ourselves, okay? And because I would, I would provide the perspective that a lot of times we enter into alliances with other folks who don't look like us and we're not prepared. Right? And or there might be a subset, because for example, education. If you ask me, where are we most organized? Have a little bit more data have a little bit more communications and have something on paper that looks like something of a strategy. We have a little bit of that in education. I haven't seen anything in housing in Latinos. Nothing. You know. I haven't seen as much in healthcare. So education may be a little bit more advanced as a subset of this broader plan, but I want to come back that this is more of a strategic effort going looking at it from our perspective in our lens over the next 5, 10, 15 years. But that doesn't mean there's some short-term efforts for that. So I don't know that that, so I do agree with what you're saying. And it's, so part of the question at the end is what's next for us? How do we build on this and make whatever document, certainly to be again a quality document if you will, that then what, our, what audiences we want to get that out to. I think the first part of an audience for any document is to build alliances with different organizations across the state and it starts with us, okay? And then yes, we, we build out beyond that. It's not mutually exclusive 
from folks that don't look like us and other partners or the private sector and so on and so forth. But I think we have to be ready for that and, and not be, because I think the examples from our panel this morning, unless I picked up some things that, that you didn't, is that sometimes we have even our own folks pulling agendas that are counterproductive to us. So it's like we're not really ready yet. So we need to be at least reasonably on the same, some kind of same page. But again, I hope I answered the question about generally what we hope to produce as best we can in the output of the next two two hours or so when folks are in the discussions. So we could break and move to those in, in the different rooms, and then we'll see you back here. I think pursuant to the agenda around 12:45. Thank you. Thank you.